Hi, this is Nick with Tim Bell Pod, and here's 10 facts on the great bruiser Brody. Brody was quite possibly the first ever true indie wrestler. Obviously, back in the territory days, everyone bounced around the country, more or less doing their own thing, but Brody was truly DIY. He did have his home bases that he'd work out of, like an All Japan, a St. Louis, a WCCW, but he was never one to hang out in a promotion for too long or engage in like year-long feuds over titles and such. Brody was more of an attraction that toured constantly, worked the promotions he wanted, developed his own character, and he never compromised for money or fame, yet still got both. Brody was an all-state football and basketball player in high school, earning a football scholarship to Iowa State before he was kicked out for undisclosed reasons. He then went to Wayne State, which also didn't work out, so he landed at West Texas State. If you know anything about West Texas State, you know where I'm going, but if you don't, this is a super cool piece of trivia. The West Texas State football program, for some reason, is known for pumping out pro wrestlers. Not only did Brody go there, but so did Terry Funk, Dory Funk Jr., Stan Hansen, Ted DiBiase, Tito Santana, Tolly Blanchard, Blackjack Mulligan, and Dusty Rhodes, and that's just some of the future wrestling legends they'd pump out. Not long after getting trained by Bob Roop and Fritz von Erich, Frank the Hammer Goodish tagged up with Stan Hansen in the Tri-State Territory, which would later become Mid-South. And this is years before they do it in all Japan. Imagine facing that tag team in a real or worked match, which is kind of the same to them. The name Bruiser Brody was given to him by Vince McMahon Sr. The WWWF booked Bruiser Frank Brody in the mid-70s to be a monster hill for babyface champion Bruno San Martino. His name would obviously end up being shortened to Bruiser Brody before Brody set out on his own very legendary singles career. Brody was the first person to take the Asian miss to the face from the first wrestler to do it, the Great Kabuki. While Brody is a legend in America, he was a god in Japan. Whether it was tagging with Stan Hansen and winning the tag titles, or just being that crazy, chain-swinging, fear-inducing force that was Brody, he was a top guy in Japan from the start, always drew, and if any place is going to remember him forever, it will definitely be Japan. While Brody is an icon from his All Japan days, he also worked in New Japan. There, Brody had some of the best matches of his career with Anoki. If you only know him from the chain-swinging hardcore stuff, his matches with Anoki prove that he's a psychology master and can also technical wrestle with the best of them. Some of these are hard to find, including the epic one-hour Broadway they had, but if you're good at the World Wide Web, definitely find them. Brody did what some consider the first ever pro wrestling shoot interview around 1987. There's some debate whether this was some kind of student film or something from a local news station, but you can find it on YouTube. It's Brody in front of a blue backdrop, and it really shows a different side of Bruiser and reminds you how articulate and intelligent this monster of a man was. January 21st, 87 in Florida, Brody had a match with Lex Luger where he gets mad and just stops working. There's a million rumors and theories on why Brody did this, but if you haven't seen it, it's truly one of the most bizarre, fun, weird things to ever happen in wrestling. Worth checking out. Bruiser Brody was murdered in Puerto Rico in 1988 by WWC's Jose Gonzalez, and it was later covered up by Carlos Colon, WWC, as well as the Puerto Rico police and courts. They did everything they could to cover this up. They moved the court dates around so much that not only did key witnesses not know when the trial was, Brody's own wife didn't know when it was. They used pro wrestling angles and bloody pictures from magazines to trick the jury into thinking he was this legit bloodthirsty monster. They threw away the case files. Jose Gonzalez's bail for murder was posted at $12,000 and was paid right away so he never stepped into a jail cell. To quote Gorilla Monsoon, it was a miscarriage of justice. For more wrestling history, find Tim Bell Pod on your favorite podcast app, or find us on YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram. <laughs>